it's Sarah here from BJC Health coming to you from Sydney, Australia. Uh, thanks for showing an interest in one of our educational events. You're about to watch part one. Um, so enjoy the event. If you've got any questions about the content, then please consider joining BJC Connect where you can access all of our facilitators live. Um, otherwise, please consider leaving a comment and we'll do our best to get back to you. Just get my slides going. Okay. So um, for a start, um, there's... These names, uh, you've probably heard cortisone, prednisone, steroids. There's a few other names you've probably heard of. They're all essentially the same things. Um, probably the only correct name there is prednisone uh, in, a, in terms of medical sense. And I'll explain why steroid is probably not a good term, but it's used widely. And so if if we use cortisone, prednisone, steroids, they're basically the same thing. In the, the When doctors use that word, it's generally the same thing. Um, but that's the first thing to clear up. The second thing to clear up is there's two different types of the way um, steroid or cortisone is used. And that's one is tablets and one is injections. It's, it's also used intravenously, but that's really in a hospital setting and it's pretty uncommon in rheumatology. So I'm really going to focus mostly on tablets and a little bit on injections towards the end. So uh, the first thing is the tablets, there's quite a few different types. So the most common one, almost used exclusively in rheumatology is prednisone or prednisolone. For all intents and purposes, they're exactly the same thing. So five milligrams prednisone equals five milligrams prednisolone. There's just very, very minor uh, differences. Uh, some of the brand names for that are Sone, Salone or Panofcourt. And there's a few others out there, but you may have heard of that or seen it written on a bottle. Now, the other, some other types of um, steroids or, or, uh, is uh, dexamethasone. That's more used in um, neurosurgery or some malignancies. Um, I mean cancers when I say malignancies. Hydrocortisone is used in some uh, hormone um, issues. And methylprednisolone and betamethasone are used less commonly as tablets, but they are actually available. There's... The other thing is the doses are not equivalent. So five milligrams of prednisone does not equal five milligrams of dexamethasone. So for instance, five milligrams of prednisone is the equivalent of about one milligram of dexamethasone. So it's very confusing. So when I'm going to be talking about things, I'm going to be talking about prednisone because that's the one that most people in this audience have probably heard of or been or, or used if you've used a, a steroid. There's three types of injections. Basically, one ampule is or vial is the same for all of them. We use Depamedrol in the clinic, which is methylprednisolone. Um, celestone is dexamethasone. Kenicort's less widely used. But the injection I'll talk about is Depamedrol. Yeah. So uh, I want everyone to pay close attention. There's a quiz on this at the end. Uh, so you need to memorize this. Um, just joking. <laughs> the, the reason I've put this up here is, again, to dispel some uh, myths. The reason why it's called steroid is if you look down the left, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but there's four rings here. Now, that's what's called a steroid ring. This is the chemical way things are. And then basically there's these side chain chemicals that come off it, and that determines oh, what it that determines uh, what it is. This, so this actually is cortisol. Cortisol is made in our body. It's a hormone in our body. And I'm going to go through what cortisol is because if you understand that, you'll completely understand prednisone and all its benefits and, and letdowns. And so cortisol is a no, type George of... George Michael is your obsession. So it's a type of corticosteroid. So its technical term is corticosteroids because you also hear of steroids. Someone's really noisy. <laughs> all right. I'm all good. Sorry, Andrew. Okay. You, you, you also hear of uh, steroids used in sport, people who abuse uh, things in sport. Now, that's testosterone or anabolic steroids. You can see the same thing. It's got the same steroid ring, but it's different side chains. And the side chains here determine what it does in the body. So when we say steroid, it's a very slang term because there's so many things that use a, 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 a technically steroids. For instance, cholesterol is a steroid. Cholic acid is, is gallbladder fluid. Um, 
estrogen and progesterone are hormones in females. They're, they're steroid hormones. Vitamin D is not even a vitamin. It's incorrectly named. It's a steroid hormone. So it's a really widely used um, uh, structure in the human body. And why is that relevant is because this is what's in the human body, cortisol, and all in medicine, all the different types of every single different type of corticosteroid, they've just chemically altered this so it lasts longer and has a different purpose in the body. And that's all it is, essentially. It's it's a synthetic form of cortisol, which is a naturally occurring hormone that we all have and is completely essential for life. So again, what you can see, I can't see this very well. I'm just going to move this. Uh, this is cortisol here. And all, all they've done, the chemists have basically changed the side, side chains to make cortisol into prednisone, and they've changed a few different side chains again to make it into dexamethasone. That's all they've done. But that completely and utterly changes the properties of it. For instance, if we gave you a cortisol tablet, it would break down in your body in a matter of seconds because your body knows how to break it down. Your body doesn't know how to break this down as quickly, so it will last many, many hours, even longer, and some of them will last even longer. And when they make it into an injection form, they again alter the structure. So when it's injected into the joint, the body doesn't break it down quickly. It lasts for weeks, even months in the, in the area um, without the body adjusting it. So that's re essentially the root, you know, understanding of what it is. And so if you then understand that we're just giving a synthetic form of cortisol, all you have to do is understand what cortisol does in your body. And this is how it all, your brain releases a hormone, which then tells your pituitary gland to release another hormone, which then tells your adrenal gland to make cortisol. And cortisol then functions all around the body. But in a rheumatology sense, the most important thing is cortisol is very good at suppressing the immune system. And in the conditions in rheumatology, a lot of the autoimmune conditions, the, the immune system's overactive. And so our treatment aims to bring it to normal. And so we do that by using a synthetic form of cortisol to do that. And it's very, very effective. So you can see uh, what cortisol does. So it leads to a weakened immune system. It can affect the heart. It can affect increase in blood pressure. It can affect blood sugars. It can affect the gut. It can affect nerves. It can affect the brain. And so your body only produces a small amount of cortisol. So generally you don't get any of these issues, but if you completely eliminate cortisol, your body runs into major issues. But when we give too big a dose, you'll get too big a problems uh, with all of these systems. And that's effectively where you get all the side effects from. So before um, prednisone or cortisone, essentially there was no treatment for almost all of the conditions in rheumatology. So in some senses, this is one of the biggest breakthroughs in medicine because literally if you got diagnosed with rheumatoid, you ended up bed bound and probably dying of rheumatoid arthritis. It was horrible. There was literally no treatment. And so when they first discovered this, they actually took um, the hormone cortisol from, um, I think it was hamsters or something, and they infused it into these people that were bed bound. And it was a complete miracle. These people literally, who hadn't walked for years, got up and walked around. People couldn't believe it. It was uh, you know, never seen before in, in medicine. And this was sort of after World War II, they started doing this. And effectively, in rheumatology, everything ever since this was discovered was trying to work out how to give as good effect from prednisone or cortisone without the side effects. Because what happened is these people who thought it was a miracle drug, a year later, they got many, many, many side effects and they realized that this wasn't such a miracle and it's a double-edged sword. You get pros and you get uh, downfalls. And so you can see the, the chemist basically rapidly developed a whole bunch of the different types of um, steroids over the next 10 years, and they're still in use today. So they've been around for decades. I mean, the good news is since the 1980s, there's been a whole heap of other treatments which are very effective in rheumatology. And the whole aim of these is to give an effect that's as good as corticosteroids without causing as many problems. And that's essentially what rheumatology is. 
So what do we use it for? Uh, in some conditions like PMR or polymyalgia rheumatica, it's usually the only treatment given and it's 100% effective. In other conditions, it's not usually used by itself. It's usually used in combination with other medicines, medicines which we know are safer in the long term. Um, when I say bridging treatment, we use it early on because it works very, very quickly, almost after the first dose. Um, but the aim is to bring down the dose over time, eventually get people off it so we don't expose people to long-term side effects. And so it's used in this way in rheumatoid arthritis, psoriatic arthritis, um, vasculitis, which is um, a little rarer, which is inflammation of blood vessels, lupus, and many, many other autoimmune conditions that are not rheumatology ones. In fact, it virtually treats any autoimmune condition in the right dose. So it's also used in asthma, emphysema, many blood disorders, in transplants, widely used in medicine. I should note that it's almost never used for ankylosing spondylitis, uh, osteoarthritis, or you know chronic spine pain. So they're the conditions that we don't use it for. It doesn't really uh, work, or the side effects are not worth the benefit. And so we use it mostly because it's very good at suppressing the immune system. Uh, so people feel good on it because when you treat the immune system and get it to normal, their problem, which is their disease, gets better. We use it because it's very fast acting, whereas a lot of the other medicines in rheumatology take weeks, if not months, to be fully effective, whereas this will be effective within days. And for instance, in PMR or polymyalgia, it treats every single person. If you don't respond to prednisone, you don't have PMR. Likewise with rheumatology, uh, rheumatoid arthritis, if you give everyone, everyone a high enough dose, everyone gets better. So it's, univer it's the only medicine where there's a 100% response rate um, as long as you give high enough dose. But the main reason we don't use it is in the long term, especially is side effects. And that's what I'm going to be spending some time on to um, go through some of this. So this is for prednisone. So just to give you an idea of what we talk about, people who are on prednisone will kind of know what these doses are. Um, so a low dose would be regarded as five milligrams or less. Uh, a moderate dose, five milligrams to 20 milligrams and a high dose over 20 milligrams. That's a rough guide. Now, if we're using it long-term, um, we really want people down to five milligrams or less because the long-term side effects are much, much less at that dose. If you're taking more than 7.5 milligrams daily on a regular basis, everyone gets side effects, every single person. So that's why it's really important to try and get the dose down. And at the higher doses, you can get side effects quite rapidly uh, on this. And so we would only use that for really important reasons. So what are the typical doses? Again, this is for prednisone. So PMR or polymyalgia, we, I mean, it varies between each individual and different rheumatologists, but generally around 15 milligrams. And it's reduced over a period of one to two years. Uh, and most people will get off it. There's a small percentage of people who need a low dose ongoing. Rheumatoid arthritis, starting dose can vary a lot, um, depending again on your situation and the rheumatologist. 10 to 15 milligrams, but most rheumatologists would aim to get people off it within a couple of months. Um, I commonly will use it because it works quickly, but I know the other medications take a couple of months. So I need some treatment to keep the person moving and functional within that initial period whilst waiting for those other medications to work. Or um, SLE, for instance, lupus arthritis, it might be 10 to 15 milligrams, a little bit like rheumatoid. If there's other conditions like vasculitis or ones that affect the organs, say you've got very bad lupus and it affects the kidneys or very bad rheumatoid and it affects your lungs or vasculitis, which is causing uh, major issues, um, a condition there is giant cell arteritis. Some of you may have heard of that. You need much higher doses. And this is where the side effects become an issue. So 25 to 50 milligrams a day. Again, trying to get it down as, as much as feasible, although if you're really very unwell and your you know, major organs are threatened, you, you might be on it for many, many months, uh, even years. Um, but that causes its own set of problems. 
So how would we reduce it? Well, ideally, you'd use it for as short as time as possible. So if you get off it too quickly, the disease flares up, you're back to square one. So you're trying to bide some time, usually while waiting for other medication. You would reduce it slowly. Um, so typically, uh, you don't go from, say, 15 milligrams down to five. You might go from 15 to 12.5 to 10 to 7.5, just to allow a smoother transition on things. If you only use it for less than two weeks duration, you can actually start it and stop it. And I'll explain why in a minute. Um, so you could use 15 milligrams for two weeks and then stop abruptly. But if you then go past two weeks, you then have to slowly reduce. And the reason is back to this diagram that I showed you before. What happens is all the hormone systems in the body have this feedback loop. So effectively, when we give prednisone, you're basically giving someone cortisol. But what that then does is it tells your brain to stop making this hormone, which then stops making this hormone, which then tells your body to not make cortisol. And so if you give lots of um, prednisone, your body will effectively make no cortisol. And then when you stop it, this system's not working. It's effectively gone to sleep. And so then you're suddenly left with no cortisol in your body, and that's a big issue. So what, we, what you do is to gradually reduce the dose to get this system working again, to get it to, to wake it up, so to speak. And so some situations, it doesn't, if you've been on prednisone for a very long time, the adrenal gland can sort of go to sleep permanently, so to speak. And that's where some people end up on very low doses of um, prednisone long-term, because every time you try and stop it, the body's just not doing its job making cortisol and you're, you're um, exposing to all the problems of having no cortisol. And so if you've, Understood where I'm, what I'm, all that technical jargon that I've said all along, and you understand how it works in the body, everything else from now on makes complete and utter logical sense. And that's why I wanted to go into a bit of the sort of scientific thing because the rest of the stuff's really easy. So, stressing it again, the main issues are long term side effects. And whenever a doctor prescribes a medicine, not just prednisone, you, always weighing up the risk versus the benefits, right? You want the benefit to be higher than the risk. And at some point that tips the other way. So if you're on for high doses for too long, the risk are, are more than the benefits. So when we weigh up uh, what are the risks, it's really based on what dose you're on, for how long you're on, and to a, to a smaller degree, your cumulative dose, like what's the total dose you've had in your lifetime. But as I said, if someone's on more than 7.5 milligram per day for more than a couple of months, people will get side effects. And so you have to have a really good reason to do that. You're protecting something, you're keeping someone functional, you can't find any other options, those sort of reasons. So all of these side effects should make sense if you followed where I'm, what I've said and what the what cortisol does in the body because all the side effects are basically what happens if you've got too much cortisol in your body. So I've broken it down into two parts. One is the short-term side effects, so you know that might occur in the first few weeks of using it, and one is the longer-term side effects. So there's really only three things that happen in the first couple of weeks. Uh, one is that you can feel hungry. Now, some people who've been put on decent doses of prednisone would know exactly what I mean. Um, you just eat and you don't feel full. And so that's where weight gain comes in. So prednisone by itself doesn't really put on weight. It's the fact that it makes you hungry and then you act on it. And particularly then if you go and eat foods that are very calorie dense and not uh, particularly healthy, the weight gain can go on fairly quickly. At higher doses, it can affect your mood. Some people find they're irritable. Some people find they're a bit down. Some people find the opposite. They're really, uh, you know, got lots of energy and, and feel great. So it goes both ways. And particularly if you take a dose in the evening, uh, some people find it hard to sleep. And certainly on higher doses, nearly everyone will find it hard to sleep. It just winds the brain up. So I'll go through these one at a time, but if you can see how many different parts of the body it affects, and that's because cortisol, which your body makes, 
goes all around the body and affects almost every system in the body. So again, when we give synthetic form of cortisol like prednisone, it'll affect every part of your body. So it can affect how you look, your skin, can cause infections, it can affect the bones, it can affect the eyes, the hormones, mental health, and others. Really, really long list, as you can see. So these these pictures are always bad, right? Um, I've plucked these off the internet. These are not people that I know, but just to demonstrate a point. Um, so it can affect the weight. You know, some people, if they've been on it a lot, can put on 10, 20 kilos, can be really not good. And that's always hard to, to lose at, afterwards. You can get some water retention, so your ankles can swell. You can get these specific looking appearances where we, it's called a moon face. So you, you, your sort of cheeks get puffy and red and, and the face becomes very rounded. Um, and you, you can get this extra deposition of fat uh, around the, the back of the neck, which is called a buffalo hump. Uh, and obviously, you can imagine, nobody likes to look like this. Um, so a lot of that is reversible um, if you stop prednisone, but um, you don't want to have to reverse these changes to start with. It can affect the skin in many ways. You can get, these are stretch marks on the skin. You can get red stretch marks on the stomach or thigh. You can get lots of bruising. In fact, most people over the age of 60 will get bruising on prednisone. Your skin just becomes very fragile, blood vessels fragile. People can bruise easily. If you're also taking aspirin, which you know many people are, pretty much everyone gets some bruises and they don't even know why. You can get extra hair growth uh, on your face, which um, you know no woman would like, clearly. Uh, maybe some men, but uh, obviously more distressing for women. Acne can occur even in older people. And it, you know, very bad case, you can get ulcers in the skin where the skin just doesn't heal very well. It can increase infections. Now, this depends on the dose. So five milligrams daily, a lot of people would argue doesn't cause many infections. The higher you go up, the more. So, and it's not even a linear increase. So it's not like 10 milligrams causes twi uh, twice as many infections as five milligrams. It's more like three to four times. And then 20 milligrams will be even higher than that. So it's an exponential in increase. And that's because the immune system is suppressed and your body can't fight infection. So when I say all infections are increased, I mean standard things like skin infections, chest infections, colds, urine infections. Um, you can get thrush as well, both um, more common in women, but also in men. Um, can predispose to thrush. And if you're on higher doses, it can really suppress your immune system and you can actually be susceptible to um, infections that you wouldn't normally get. So we call them opportunistic infections. So, you know, some weird fungus infections that a normal immune system would just deal with and you'd never get. And um, when I say high doses, again, more than 20 milligrams, long-term 20 milligrams. Most people have heard it affects your bones. Um, it can cause, by affecting your bones, I mean it weakens the bones. That does not cause pain. It just makes you more susceptible to a fracture. Um, and it tends to occur fairly rapidly. Within the first three to six months is the most rapid loss of bone, um, bone strength. And so a lot of rheumatologists would get a bone density scan to see how the stronger bones are to start with. We'd often try and get you moving if possible to keep the bones uh, strong. And uh, most would recommend getting adequate calcium intake, ideally through standard um, dairy intake and diet, but sometimes you might need a supplement. We'd like your vitamin D at a probably higher than normal level, so at least 60 to 80, to, um, as that's one of the building blocks for bones. And if your bones start out even slightly weak, so... Some people will, so it's not quite normal, but it's not osteoporosis. It's in between called osteopenia. You'd still usually rec recommend a uh, medication to protect the bones because we know that we don't want them dropping further. And you may not need to be that on that very long term, but certainly while you're on the decent doses of prednisone. And so we can do some things to protect the bones as long as it's thought of. So you've just finished watching part one of one of our recent educational events. Hope you enjoyed the content. If you'd like to access part two, then you need to sign up for BJC Connect. 
It's a free platform where you can access not just the recordings of our past events, but also access a whole range of upcoming future events and access our team of facilitators live. Um, all of the details that you need to join VDC Connected now flashing up on your screen. But otherwise, like our staff, subscribe if you'd like to see more information from VJC Health. Look forward to seeing you in an event soon.